Welcome to today's Notre Dame webinar, American Democracy at Risk, a Global Comparative Perspective. Thank you for joining us. We are just uh, eight days from the uh, voting uh, in the United States. It's of course already going on, but concludes in eight days. And uh, there's great anticipation, nervousness, anxiety, even fear of what may come from the election and in the days after. And there have been many commentaries and articles everywhere, stories in the press. Uh, and that's what we're gonna discuss today. But what we'll offer here is what we think is a, a unique perspective, uh, a global comparative look that's based on a survey of political scientists who study US elections and international elections. We're looking here today uh, not at the candidates, but at the voting process itself, at the underlying institutions and policies of the US electoral system, and to try to learn lessons from the uh, experience of international elections for both short-term benefit, what we can do now and what we can expect next week and the days immediately after the voting, but also a longer per term perspective to understand the risks that have been identified and what can be done about them. Uh, sponsoring this event today is the Notre Dame Keogh School of Global Affairs Global Policy Initiative. Our Global Policy Initiative helps to shape the policy and oriented research and engagement and practice of the Keogh School and its faculty for ethical and effective solutions to global challenges. So today in our panel, uh, we have several distinguished experts uh, and also two scholars who re, uh, complete, concluded a study that's being released today and that we'll be discussing uh, throughout this conversation. So let me introduce our panelists. I'll introduce all four of them and then they will speak in this order and then we'll have lots of opportunities for uh, conversation when they finish their presentations. Uh, first will be Maggie Schum. Maggie is a postdoctoral research associate at the Keogh School, and her research focuses on party organization, participatory institutions, and contentious politics in Latin America and in her native Hong Kong. Also with us is uh, Bishara Mohammed is currently a graduate student in the master's program of global affairs program at the University of Notre Dame. And she has three years of experience in working in mental health counseling and other uh, projects in Kenya, in South Africa and Djibouti. Also, Paul Friesen is a PhD candidate in political science and a PhD fellow at the Kellogg Institute for International Studies here at Notre Dame. And his research focuses on African elections, political parties, and political behavior. And also joining us is Abby Cordoba, who's a research, uh, who's an associate professor of global affairs at the Keogh School and is also affiliated with the Kellogg Institute. Cordoba's research examines consequences of inequality and marginalization for democracy and other issues in Latin America and the Caribbean, especially. So we'll begin with Maggie and Paul, and then Abby and then Bashar in that order. So Maggie, please. Hi, thank you. So good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us at this panel. And I would like I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Kyoto School of Global Affairs as well as the Global Policy Initiative for their support in the publication of the report as well as hosting this event. Also, a quick shout out to my other co-authors whom I had an honor to work with. So Paul Frisson. Ilana Rothkoff, Luis Shannani, and Ro Romilia Solano. Thank you so much. So the title of our report, American Democracy at Risk, it really captures the reason why our team started this project. So we're all political scientists that study democracy and election in different regions. So in Africa, in Latin America, the Middle East, East Asia, and the US. So back in August, when we came together to talk about this uh, election, we were very worried as headlines of mounting concerns about the fairness of elections, 
uh, a presidential candidate that condoning and citing violence and rallies and also subversion of uh, rule of law, they have been rolling out daily. So not only because they were signs that deviates from democratic norms and institutional practice, but more importantly, what those signs entail for American democracy in the long term. So as we have seen in other countries, such as Brazil, Hungary, Poland, and the Philippines, just to name a few, as democratic institutions and norms weakens, it has dire consequences for the long term. So for the longest time, the US has been seen as a beacon of democracy, and many believe that the US constitutional system and its institutions are invincible, and that, that, and that they could weather politicians' bad behaviors and abuses. But unfortunately, it may no longer be the case. So um, as reflected by the number of well-regarded uh, global democracy indices, such as Freedom House and the variety of democracy, the rating of the US democracy has been dropping. So let me point you to the graph on the screen. So this is the, uh, a graph of the US taken from the variety of democracy. What you see here is a measurement of uh, electoral democracy, which captures the quality of election, whether elections are fair and free, uh, are free and fair, whether they're accompanied by the civil liberties and rights that make the election uh, free and fair, and also whether there's full suffrage and the, uh, and, and the level of competitions. So as you can see, the US trend has been quite stable until in 2016, which is what you can see uh, in, the, in the shaded, um, in the shaded uh, area, where that's the, the point where the declining trend started. And, then, um, and also similarly in Freedom House, uh, also dropped the freedom score for the US uh, in 2017. So constitutions and institutions by themselves, they are not enough to protect democracy. Democracy needs to be actively safeguarded and strengthened by political elites and also by us, the American public. So let me narrow it down to focus on the elections. So what we have seen so far are unprecedented circumstances in the modern American context, such as the integrity of the electoral process are being under, are under questions an increasing threat of violence. And most worrisome is that President Trump refuses to guarantee a peaceful power transfer should he lose. Democracy require parties knowing how to lose. They require them to accept defeat and play the election game next year. So the past US election may not give us much insight in how to mitigate those challenges. Yes, scholars like us studying democracy and volatile election in other country is at a good position to provide a comprehensive perspective to address current um, risks in the US election. So this feature of including both the US and global expert in elections is one key contribution that our report offers. Paul, can you go to the next slide? Thank you. So let me talk a little bit about research. So our research has three parts. So at first, we designed an expert survey with in total 22 uh, pre-elections and voting day scenarios. We asked our expert to rank them uh, according to the likelihood whether a scenario would happen, and then also the impact on the legitimacy of the elections should the scenario happen from a scale of zero to 10. So zero means like it's not likely to happen and it has no damage to the integrity of election. And 10 meaning that it's highly likely to happen and it will have uh, dire consequences to the elections. And then, then we multiply these two sets of number to come up with a measurement that indicates the level of concern for that particular scenario. So that's the first part. And then the second part is basically a follow-up of the, the expert survey. We asked the expert for the qualitative inputs on mitigating strategy from some of the most concerning scenarios. And lastly, the third part, we also designed a path selection game to capture the different path in the post-election period. And we also asked this expert to evaluate the damage on democracy in each path. So uh, Paul is gonna tell you more about that in detail shortly. And next slide. So who are our experts? So we asked 150 political scientists to participate in our study. So 59 of them, they are, uh, they are university professors. 30% of them are um, PhD students. We have more male than female, but it uh, reflects uh, the, the gender distribution in the, in the uh, political science organization that we sample our experts. 
And 92% of them uh, reported that they're following the election extremely or very closely. And in terms of the expertise, 44% of them are uh, US election experts, 28% of them study elections in other country, and 24% of them study uh, elections both in US and other country. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here's the graph. So this graph uh, summarizes our finding for the pre-election period. So let me quickly explain the graph a little bit. So we are looking at, uh, we're uh, trying to look at the question in two dimension. So the likelihood whether a scenario is happening. So that's um, um, the horizontal um, uh, axis. And then on a vertical axis, it uh, captures the level of damage that it may have on election integrity. And then the color scheme should be quite uh, intuitive. So the red zone or, or, or scenarios in the red zones are the most concerning. And then the yellow zone is moderate and in the green zone, it's, uh, it's in the least concern. Um, so in the, uh, the pre-election phase, respondents were most concerned about the president's attack on media, the reduction in the access to voting and both foreign and domestic disinformation campaigns. So just a quick note in terms of the timing for their survey. So we sent out a survey in September, but between the time, the time between the, the end of our survey to now, as we know, many things have happened. And given the information we have now, actually a lot of scenarios that were deemed less likely to happen are either more likely now or is happening. So just let me point to some of them. For example, for foreign disinformation, um, we have we have known that Russia has um, has has have this um, effort into meddling the elections. But as a report by the FBI um, uh, last week, that's all mentioned that Iran also have been taking steps to influence the vote by sending intimidating emails to Democrat voters. So and also in terms of investigating uh, political opponents, so the recent buzz about um, Trump and Giuliani calling for the investigation on Hunter Biden's so close to the election. So that yellow box is very likely going to the, to the red zone now. And lastly, for domestic disinformation, there are cases of unauthorized ballot boxes appearing in, in counties in California. And there are also many other activities online that is um, sharing uh, wrong information about voting. So very, un really, unfortunately, a lot of our scenarios are moving to the red zone. Uh, next slide. So in, similarly, in the voting period, in a voting day period, um, expert has serious concern about the premature announcement of the results, uh, the dispute over mail-in ballots, and the voter intimidations. And very similarly, a lot, some, of the, some of the boxes, the, the yellow boxes, uh, are going towards more, more towards the red zone. So like, uh, there's one scenario that where we're concerned about candidates' health. So that was like really one of the least concerned scenario. But, we all know President Trump got sick with COVID, and of course, um, this has it has uh, uh, important consequences if the if if a candidate's health is in in trouble. So um, let's see. Okay, and next slide. Okay, thank you. So really, one final note from me is that. Since we include the US and global expert in our survey, we find that global experts consistently rate scenario more concerning compared to their US colleagues. So American election experts, uh, they downplay a situation where there may be violence or the use of democratic institution for non-democratic means. Yet the recent development of a lot of uh, worsening trends, it suggests that perhaps as one of my co-authors mentioned, in essence, if it happens there, it actually can happen here in the US. So I'll give it to Paul to talk a little bit more about the game selection, um, the past selection game, and also uh, some of the mitigation strategy from our survey. So take it away, Paul. Thanks, Maggie. And it's good to be with everyone today. I wanna just say thank you again to our other three co-authors who aren't on the panel, but who put in a lot of work to making this happen in a short time period. And also David and the Keogh School for supporting us in releasing the report under the uh, Global Policy Initiative. So we've talked about two of the electoral phases, specifically pre-voting and then during voting, since this is encompassing um, several days. But there's been a lot of interest in what's going to happen this year after voting is done. 
um, after most of the ballots are counted. And once people um, generally agree that one of the two candidates, uh, Trump or Biden, is the legitimate winner of the elections. Uh, it might be days after November 3rd, it might be weeks or maybe one to two months, we don't really know. But to try to get a sense of this, we instead created a path selection game. And this is um, a little bit like a choose your own adventure game where you're prompted with a scenario and we had our experts rate them uh, by the likelihood of each choice. So for example, our first option was um, the loser of the election rejects the outcome outright. Um, so we would have our experts rate that from zero to 10. And we would use that probability um, to randomly select whether that event occurred or not. Um, and this gives us a interactive model that we can use to um, analyze the entire process and not just one uh, choice at a time. We don't consider this a, a true prediction. We're not saying that once a certain event will come true or won't come true. But what we can say is that certain events based on our expert ratings are more likely or less likely or about evenly likely to occur. And we can see that um, certain events become more or less likely after they follow initial events. Um, so in this way, it simulates kind of a war game scenario. We had three starting points. Uh, starting point one and two uh, were that Biden had won the election, either by a landslide or by a close margin. And then in scenario three, Trump won the election by a close margin. The graphic that you see on the screen incorporates all of the data from those first two, which we wanna focus on today. Um, and it represents about 100 experts playing this game, where Biden first, we prompt them that Biden has won the election. So the way to interpret this graph is that the size of each of these uh, paths, so for example, on the first node, you can see that the no is a lot skinnier than the yes. That incorporates how many experts traveled down that path. So in our first scenario, we find that about 80% of experts believe that Trump uh, will reject the outcome if Biden is generally recognized as the winner. And you can follow uh, the size of these paths all the way down um, to their ending. We also um, wanted to get an estimate of how damaging these events would be uh, to American democracy in general. So the, this is uh, shown on a scale from blue where it's like very low um, impact on American democracy to red very severe high impact uh, given the set of scenarios that occur. So we know that um, about 80% of the time we found that Trump rejected the outcome. And I think surprisingly to our team, we don't see a huge disparity between the landslide scenario and the close election scenario. And that if we divide it further into those two starting points, it's about 85 and 75. Um, and so we believe that the margin of victory will probably not be very influential on Trump's decision um, after Biden is announced in this hypothetical scenario. We also find that Trump is uh, still likely to reject any loss even after he submits a court ruling and perhaps the Supreme Court rules against him. Uh, it's still more likely than not that he will continue to reject and not step down um, and concede to Biden. So worryingly, this brings about a scenario where um, what we call extra institutional actions may be required to resolve the situation. In Americanist or people that study American politics, they usually refer to this as a constitutional crisis where there's not a clear institutional legal pathway to resolve the issue. Um, we see this much more commonly in other countries. And so we do have some experience and research about when they occur and uh, which events are more or less damaging to democracy, but they may include things like a coup or a forced removal of a leader refusing to step down in extreme cases. They might include an informal bargain between political elites, say the Democrats and Republicans, um, including in Congress. 
They may also include international mediation from the UN or from other major countries, which is a little bit difficult to imagine in the case of the United States. And also in rare cases, governments of national unity or power sharing agreements between the two parties if they cannot resolve the issues. We also find that when the, um, during these path games, when we get to the point of a challenge in the Supreme Court, it's generally more damaging than not. Um, and especially if in this case, if the Supreme Court overturns a Biden win, we find this as the most impactful um, alongside these institutional actions outcomes. So these are the two outcomes that our experts rated as very serious. The Supreme Court overturns a Biden win or if in extra institutional actions are required. And though we don't show it here, we do also analyze a Trump win scenario. And the main differences that we find are that mass protests and then violence and repression are two to three times more likely in that scenario, even though Biden himself is less likely to reject um, the election results should he lose. So our experts, um, thought that democratic forces, so um, activists and other party leaders aside from Biden, will be much more likely than Trump supporters to engage in mass protest, um, which should also open the door for increased violence during the post-election period. So what can, so we found this a little bit uh, troubling, a little bit. Um, of course, this is just a, an exercise in the hypothetical. It doesn't mean that any of these things are or are not gonna happen. But we wanted to also gather information from our experts about what we can do at different phases of the electoral process. So, and this is just a summary of lots of feedback that we got from our experts. Um, during the voting period, which includes now and through election day, we need to make sure that we have security at polling stations um, really well thought out and planned. And this is because from a, for a range of reasons, uh, COVID concerns, um, increased likelihood just because of the polarization for extremist groups and um, uh, party officials to gather at polling stations. And in other countries, we see that this is a recipe for violence at and around polling stations. Um, so this, this will include the, the um, appropriate deployment of local law enforcement in situations where it is highly volatile. We also recognize the importance of deploying civil society actors, uh, reporters, so journalists, lawyers, mediators can be uh, really great resources in uh, solving problems with accounting or problems with voting should they arise. And um, our last point is, has to do around with information of educating citizens on voting procedures and the expectations. And of course, this has been a little bit of a mixed bag, depending on what news source you're following and what politicians you're listening to, where there's been some very good information, some very bad information out there. As we move closer into uh, voting, the actual process or um, the actual event of voting, and um, when votes are being counted, there's our, our experts and our research really pointed to the supporting cast for each of the candidates. So this would include uh, senators, other party officials, um, past presidents, to put pressure on the loser of the election to peacefully concede. And this is uh, something that is highlighted in comparative research uh, especially um, the book, How Democracies Die. And we recognize it as a very important moment when these other political elites are putting pressure on a person when it appears that they've lost the election to concede and not continue to cause divisions and conflict. Um, also during the voting, right after the voting process, um, we recognize de-escalation by law enforcement and preparing for civil unrest, especially when uh, protesters and counter protesters are within the same space, which we saw over the summer was a recipe for violence and even death around some of the racial justice protests. And we need to be careful not to repeat that during the electoral uh, period. 
And finally, uh, media rejecting presumptive claims. This includes uh, early annou announcements of winning, um, false uh, allegations of fraud. Um, and I expect that we will, we've already seen some of those before very many votes have been counted. And I think our team expects to see that increase, these instances of questionable counting methods, something happened to the ballots. Um, we expect those to continue to um, occur and they need to be judged with a critical eye and treated appropriately by the media. And finally, just to wrap up our report findings, we wanna highlight some long-term issues that our experts highlighted in the survey. Number one, which was one of our most common responses was social media regulation and reform, which is a hot button issue both in Congress and among uh, political scientists and other experts. We also need to invest in further election uh, security, specifically cybersecurity, um, work on vote tracking technology. And a lot of experts have um, again reiterated that there's no substitute for paper ballots and making sure that um, when a vote is cast, it is trackable and it can be audited in the future if need be, which is not uh, the case for all states currently. We also highlighted um, legal reforms for automatic voter registration to try to increase turnout, the possibility, as we said, of civil society, international, domestic, nonpartisan election officials and poll watchers. Um, and finally, structural reforms, and we highlight two here, though there could be many, having to do with uh, reinstituting protections that were under the Voting Rights Act, as we've seen increased suppression of votes, especially in Southern states over the last few elections, and also reforming the Electoral College um, and moving towards a popular vote, uh, especially a two round popular vote system, which is the, the, the standard quo for other countries around the world. So let me finish there. I just wanna say thank you again for joining us and I'll turn it back over to David. Okay, well, thank you to Maggie and Paul for uh, presenting the findings. Uh, now let's have a couple of reactions. Uh, first with uh, Professor Abby Cordoba. Okay, thank you so much for the invitation to join uh, the panel. Let me start by saying that the trend that we are seeing in the US, um, the scholars have actually warned us that what we are observing now is part of a global trend denominated authoritarian populism. Some of the leaders who have engaged in, in a authoritarian populist rhetoric in the context of Latin America include Hugo Chavez and Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela, Bolsonaro in Brazil, and in the US, Donald Trump. Uh, an authoritarian populist rhetoric actually engages in the delegitimization of democratic institutions, including the electoral process, suggesting that alternatives to democratic procedures might be necessary. And we have seen this play out when Donald Trump has actually encouraged extremist groups. In addition, um, an authoritarian populist rhetoric also instills fear among the population by reinforcing perceptions of threat to further justify um, why the use of force or, or extra legal action uh, might be necessary. For example, um, we can see how Trump's speech infuses fear when he says, quote, I'm about law and order, about having you safe. I don't want to build low income housing next to your house. And he says this um, in the context of growing ethnic and racial diversity in suburban areas, which reinforces um, racial discrimination. So the literature, a lot of it for Latin America, a region of the world where fear of crime and violence is widespread and social divisions um, still prevail, suggests that an authoritarian populist rhetoric is likely to erode citizens' democratic values and also result in relatively low voter turnout rates, particularly among non-partisans in the context of the US. 
in light of uh, authoritarian populist rhetoric, a first question that emerges is whether citizens in the US will remain committed to democracy in the long term. Data from the America's Barometer Survey uh, showed that citizens support for democracy uh, in the US started actually high back in 2017 compared to other countries in the Western hemisphere. However, here it's important to indicate that support for democracy was actually not universal and that it is not universal now with only 73% of US citizens on average expressing high support for democracy. Support for democracy um, back in 2017 was actually higher in countries like Argentina and particularly in Uruguay than in the US. In addition, a survey carried out last month in the US by the Public Religion Research Institute shows some concerning results. When citizens uh, were asked if they agreed that we need a leader who is willing to break some rules if that's what it takes to set things right, a much higher percentage of those who are more likely to favor the political party of the president said yes compared to Democrats and independents, suggesting that an authoritarian populist rhetoric actually um, erodes um, democratic values. This data also suggests that political polarization in the US is not only due to different opinions in policy or issues, but also manifest in different degrees of commitment to democratic rule among citizens who identify with different political parties. The second question that I would like to address more from the point of view of what might be the impact uh, of some of the trends that we are uh, seeing and particularly of authoritarian populism in the context of the US um, from the point of view of citizens and their political behavior is what is the likely effect of perceptions of threat on voter turnout? And as you know, the electoral campaign in the US has been marked by threats to politicians and candidates and voter intimidation by extremist groups. Unfortunately, to some extent, this is very much uh, what we see that happens in countries in Latin America, like Mexico and El Salvador, where drug cartels and guns often threaten electoral processes. Our own colleagues, um, Guillermo Trejo and Sandra Ley have documented this phenomenon for Mexico. And in my own research, I have documented how guns in El Salvador intimidate voters so they vote for a given political party. Some of this research in the context of Latin America, particularly Mexico and El Salvador, shows the fear of violence by illicit armed groups and also fear of a state repression lowers voter turnout, suggesting that something similar could occur in the current context of the election in the US, particularly among individuals uh, who don't identify with a given political party, namely non-partisans. And that said, I mean, we are observing record numbers of US citizens voting early, which is encouraging. Um, however, in light of voter intimidation and the threat of violence, some segments of the population might not turn out to vote which could result in one candidate or the other winning by a small margin, which might actually increase uh, the likelihood of social turmoil. So in short, as my colleagues um, said already, and in this uh, really um, great uh, report that they have put together, threats, threats to democracy in the US are real, unfortunately. But just like them, I also remain hopeful that political institutions are strong and will, and will safeguard the integrity of the election. I'm also, I mean, maybe more concerned about the long-term consequences in terms of citizen support for democracy, because um, we know that democracy can only grow and flourish if all citizens embrace democratic values and restore their faith in democratic institutions. I very much look forward um, to the Q&A. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, Mishara, please. Um, um, thank you all for joining the webinar. Um, I will discuss um, Kenya's um, perspective and its experience with post-election violence and its response to um, dealing with the post-election violence and uh, electoral irregularities. Um, let me just, uh, so um, historically, Kenya has had peaceful um, elections um, because it, we had a dictatorship in, for 24 years and we haven't had um, post-election violence until 12 years ago in 2007, 2008. So my presentation will cover two themes um, related to the root causes of protest and post-election violence in Kenya. One of them is irregularities with the electoral, manage, electoral manage, management system and the other one is class inequalities. So as I, as I mentioned, until 2007, 2008 post-election violence, uh, we, we didn't have any post-election violence. And I was, uh, in, that, in that election period, we had um, a thousand people dead um, as a result of police brutality and ethnic killings. And as many as 50 people died in the 2017 um, elections, that, which, which uh, was a result of election results that were contested. So, in the 2007-2008 crisis that was mediated by the former UN Secretary General um, Kofi Annan, we had a power sharing um, agreement as I think was one of the scenarios that Paul mentioned will happen if Donald Trump um, um, declines or rejects the results. So as a result of the mediation process, an independent review commission headed by the retired South African judge, Johan Krigler, concluded that the 2007 polls had been marked by large scale vote tampering and he made specific recommendations that the country could undertake and in future elections. And I wanted to review this um, recommendations and see how far it has been implemented by the Kenyan government. So, um, wait. I can't seem to move the, the castle. Uh, okay, wait, I think it's this one. Um, so yeah, the, the first recommendation was, the, was, was an overhaul for the technical systems for tallying, recording and transmitting results, which hasn't been implemented as you can see um, by the photo on the side. Um, in, two, in 2017, um, the results were canceled by the Supreme Court because um, um, the, the Supreme Court uh, decided that the, that the 2017 elections were, were not, um, the results were not accurate. So we still have a long way to go uh, in implementing that. And a, another recommendation was um, a progressive constitution, which has been successfully adopted in, 20, in, 20, in 2010. This now requires the ultimate winner to garner more than 50% of the vote nationally. So in 2017, when we had the post, uh, when we had the elections in August that declared Uhuru Kenyatta, the incumbent president as president, um, and the result was contested. We had to go back to the polls in October, which did not make sense because um, how can an electoral system um, change its, um, change the whole, change its uh, irregularities in two months. So nobody, who was supporting the opposition went back to vote in October. And, and as a result, the current president got 98% of the votes and had to be sworn in, regardless of how many people showed up. So in that sense, um, I, um, it hasn't been implemented. Another recommendation is the selection of electoral commissioners uh, has been made more inclusive in the sense that Kenya has 42 tribes and as a result of the ethnic killings, um, the, 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 review, the, review, the review commission decided that if we had maybe more inclusivity in the electoral commissioners, there will be less irregularities, which has been implemented. The other recommendation is parliament now has the power to vet most of the pres presidential appointees and an oversight of the cabinet through departmental committees. So, what hasn't changed in the country so far is the behavior of politicians inciting 
division and using civilians as pawns. And I think that's that's one of the main um, themes or the reasons that protests happen because um, poly, uh, protesters align with different politicians. And uh, another thing is corruption in every part of the independent elections, elections and boundaries commission. Um, it has rushed procurement with little lead time for testing, which has led to irregular contested results for the past um, three elections. And contrary to popular narratives, class inequality is what drives protests in Kenya, not ethnic disputes. So all the protests er that erupted in, in, in Kenya were mainly in, were mainly in slums e in Nairobi, Kisumu and Mombasa, the major cities in Kenya. And it's no secret that Kenya is ruled by the minority elite. So many, many, of, the, many of the protesters really um, protested because they lack um, uh, normal day-to-day -day wages that they can help, that can help them improve their lifestyle. And another thing is Kenyans, more so the youth aligned with Raila Odinga, the opposition candidates campaign and saw him as a way out of the high unemployment rate, lack of healthcare and declining social services. Kenyans don't see a way out of this um, misery and thus violence in the upcoming elections will be inevitable if a new candidate with progressive policies is not on the, ba on the ballot. And I think this has been um, a similarity with, the, with how millennials and young people have rallied behind um, Bernie Sanders with his pro progressive ideas. So um, in, the, in the sense that if, if a progressive leader is not on the ballot, I think young people who have no other means to make a living then protest is inevitable in that sense. Um, um, in conclusion, the, in, in the installation of a transparent, efficient electoral management system will go a long way to asserting public concerns. The IEBC should communicate to the public and international partners what extra help it, it needs to implement the various technical steps, including a fast-tracked procurement of technology and meeting the needs of protesters by inclusion, electing their candidates of choice and eliminating their barriers to participate in the political arena is critical. Currently, the average age of a Kenyan parliamentarian is 68 years old. So we really feel disconnected from um, the policies that shape our lifestyle and our way of living in Kenya because nobody, we feel like um, we don't have rep representatives in, in the government. And finally, marginalized groups made only minimal gains in the 2017 election. Political participation for women, youth, and people with disabilities fell far short of international standards, and it failed to meet Kenya's constitutional requirements, especially regarding the one-third gender quota for women's representation. Thank you so much, and I welcome any questions from the audience. Okay. All of the panelists for rich findings from the study itself, the report, and then also from our perspectives in Latin America and, and Kenya. Uh, we have opportunity now for conversation. Uh, and uh, those of you who are on the line can go to the Q&A uh, button on the bottom of your screen and uh, type in a, a comment or question. And I will try to uh, present that uh, to the panelists. Uh, a couple of you have already done that, so I can start with a few questions that have come up. And um, so one of the, the first ones that came was uh, in terms of the immediate uh, period in the United States, the next eight days and on election day itself. Um, the question is, uh, what can be done to make the voting on election day more accessible to as many people as possible? regardless of socioeconomic or other considerations. So uh, maybe I could ask either any one of the panelists, but maybe Maggie or Paul, if they have uh, suggestions from their study on uh, what things uh, can be done or maybe are already being done to increase access of voters to the polls here in these last days. You want to take it or 
let me let me just highlight a couple things and then Maggie can fill it in. Um, the thing that we focused on in the survey was having too few polling stations, and we particularly uh, wanted to include that because of the how the primaries were going specifically in um, like Wisconsin. And so we saw instances because of COVID over the summer, there was there's just not enough voting infrastructure. There's just not enough places to vote. And we get long lines of people, um, which isn't great for COVID, obviously. Um, it discourages people from voting because they have to wait and to vote. And so we really saw that bear out in the survey as one of the top concerns, like one of the top three concerns that there is. Um, we didn't specifically include this, but in some places there will not be enough early voting polling places, especially when mail-in voting is not available. And then on election day, we really have no idea whether um, the polling places that have been established are going to be adequate to really be inclusive and allow people to vote in a timely and safe manner. So that's something um, that our report definitely highlights. Maggie, did you have anything else to add? Yeah, basically on along the same line, because um, and also because we're eight days away from elections, so a lot of things like it's to think ahead of what happened in next election, right? So I think for now is that we need good information of how to vote safely, how in person, and how to vote correctly, and um, and also to let the voters know their rights, saying that you may be in long line, and then but that's. That's just no case that people can turn you away. So basically to let people know that, okay, this is not the best scenario, but you have the right and don't be swayed to go away or to give up your, uh, to give up, you know, your vote. So those are kind of like uh, the, the information campaign that, um, in, that showed up in some of our mitigation strategy. And of course, um, as Paul in, in his uh, presentation mentioned, to think about long-term, right, what we can do to make voting more um, like to make voting easier and less costly for, for, the, for the American citizens. So for example, you know, thinking about reform to streamline voting, to, to make it um, so that to let people, more people that they can vote and turn out to vote. So, but, um, but kind of to draw back to the question in the next eight days, that's just really very limited things that we can do to drastically change the situation. But again, uh, we, we, we believe that um, uh, to safeguarding democracy, you know, people like American public has, has, a, has the agency to do that. So definitely, you know, know your right and go vote. Okay. Abby, yeah, uh, where are you on yes. there? Thank you. Given that there are only, uh, you know, few days to, to really um, motivate the public to, to vote, uh, in my view, really, um, this kind of mobilization has to happen at the local level and not just like the media at the national level. And even for me living here in South Bend, it has been um, really uh, kind of satisfying to see the role of neighborhood associations in providing information to everyone in the community, at least, you know, to know where to vote. I think that there is a lot of uh, grassroots uh, kind of initiatives that, you know, we all can do actually. Okay, thank you. Um, another question has come in uh, on the potential threat of violence. So it says, uh, given the rise of uh, right-wing militias and the presence of some violence on the left side or left-wing groups, uh, what can be done to avoid bloodshed in the streets in the, in the election days and the days after? That could be for any of you, so please. <laughs> okay, I can, I can start it first. It is a very hard question, right? Because, um, you know, with the heightening polarization and as David, as you started, you know, people are very worried and scared and, you know, really heightened emotions. Um, so, but let's see, I mean, that's risk of, you know, being out there. And, um, and again, you know, it's, a, in, in, in a way that how, like, I think one way is to, as Paul mentioned, that we have to be prepared for unrest, but how do we prepare for unrest, right? So in a way that I would, there's a lot of, um, uh, oh, 
Oh, oh there's a lot of um, um, organizations. So for example, you have organization like Choose Democracy, you have uh, groups um, called Hold the Line Guy, as well as um, uh, protect, protect the Result. So those, there's a lot of efforts into, into bringing people in a group to, um, to use a nonviolent way as a way to protest, to, to uphold the, the elections. And I think those are good ways to go, right? Uh, imagine if you're on a street, you're just on your own. Of course, it's intimidating. But if you are in a group, in a group that is committed to nonviolence tactic, to, because there's so many, so many things you can do using nonviolence tactic to hold off. And, all, and, and also, for example, to think about um, you have expert in mediation, so those people will be will be very val uh, it will be very very valuable in on the street to de-escalate to de-escalate any violence because when and and because the gun the gun the gun culture in the U.S. is very frightening. You know, people are just you know trigger happy and and that we can have and we can have a, a, a horrendous tra tra uh, tragedy. So. Um, yeah, in a way that like um, there's definitely go check out a lot of your local community or your more national effort into you know joining those group that is um, that is committed to nonviolence tactic in terms of uh, protesting and showing our support to to the democratic system. Anyone else to answer on that, um, Paul? Yes, please jump in with thanks, Maggie. A couple other points. Um, Number one, I think the, the rhetoric of our political leaders really matters. Um, when tensions are running high and you feel like um, there's frustration, regret with not winning the election or your candidate not winning the election, um, there's just a lot of emotion there and a lot of anger. And when that is prompted and cited by a political leader, um, them telling their supporters that it's okay to, it's okay to engage in violence that makes a huge difference. And we see that from case studies around the world. And so far in our electoral cycle, including um, the liberate Michigan quote, followed by a plot to kill the governor, and then um, seemingly not condemning that act by the president later on. Also, and I just wanna repeat this, I mentioned this earlier, is that the deployment of law enforcement is um, very important. So having, um, um, law enforcement in place to keep counter protesters away from each other will be very important within these spaces when there are there is the announcement of a protest. And again, we saw that when there were protesters, counter protesters in the same space, and some of them were armed, that's when people died during protests this summer. Um, and yeah, so I just want to focus on those two things in addition. I wonder if I could ask uh, Bashara um, to say a word about the Kenya experience. There was the terrible violence in 07 and 08, as you mentioned. And even though there are still many problems, as you also pointed out in the electoral and democratic system, uh, it appears that the violence has been less. And I understand there were many efforts in the communities to try to uh, encourage people to not resort to violence. Uh, do you have anything you might share about that with us, please? Um, yes, um, so I think in, in different communities and in different capacities, young people have, um, with the help of the media and other agencies in, in, our own, in our own communities, we rallied behind a message of peace and a, and a, and a carav caravan of peace. Um, more specifically, I joined um, the, um, my university club where we tried to advocate for peaceful um, elections through um, voting of um, um, what do you call um, public um, educate uh, awareness on um, voting uh, voting rights and how we can peacefully vote through through talking to young people to um, register and vote because their vote matters so I think using different um, uh, Using different means ac across um, across different com in, in the community helps. Um, so we, we did this through the university, as I mentioned, and also the mosques and the churches and youth clubs, just to make sure that you, people utilize their right to vote and do it in a very peaceful manner. Great. Thank you. 
Uh, if I might add a, a point, maybe a little bit of a shameless self-promotion, but at the uh, Keo School, we just uh, posted a, a blog that I co-authored with a colleague uh, entitled To Save Democracy and Advance Racial Justice. And in there, we, we point out how uh, most of the protests that have occurred for racial justice, as Paul was mentioning, since June have been peaceful, more than 93%, according to research. Uh, and we also know from uh, empirical research uh, in nonviolent social resistance that uh, these nonviolent methods are much more effective than the use of violence. And those people may be angry and frustrated and really uh, urgently wanting a, a radical change, but the way to go about that is through nonviolent methods and resistance methods. They work better and, and they are more effective for the long term and will win over more people to the, the cause of democracy. So um, let me go to a couple other questions that, have, that came in. Now, these are looking at some of the more longer term kinds of structural issues that you mentioned in your report and that uh, the other panelists mentioned. Um, you talk about uh, the problems of social media that ranked high and, and uh, disinformation campaigns that come largely through social media. Uh, what can be done uh, this is a problem in the US, but really globally, what can be done to protect uh, the democracy and democratic values against uh, disinformation and hate speech and so much of, of the uh, messaging that comes across in social media of all kinds from social media groups to Fox channels and other such. So what can be done to really try to get a grip on uh, these mass communications, social media communications uh, to enhance the values and the structures of democracy. Uh, Abby, you want to start? From that? Yes, uh, I just want to highlight the importance of universities and schools to really not only educate uh, students who attend those um, universities or uh, schools, but really educate the public as well. And so I think us as academics, practitioners in universities or academic settings um, have that responsibility in a way. And events like this, you know, it's one way, right? Like, and, but we need to be very vocal um, about um, what is accurate and what is not, and maybe take even um, like a more proactive kind of attitude to make the news as well uh, and just to disseminate the results of our research and what we know uh, from other countries and the US um, to really counter uh, the misinformation trend that we see. So I think that we have a lot of responsibility in particular at universities and schools. Thank you. Okay. Other panelists uh, wanna respond on that? On the social media aspects? Um. Um, just real quick. So in our slides, we talk about regulation. Um, so that implies that there's an active role for the government, especially Congress and new legislation. And that really was made clear to me talking to a social media political science expert and that the social media companies are not incentivized to promote democracy and even really reduce false information and take off, like take off false accounts. And they are doing those things when they're in the spotlight and getting flack in the media for it. But their main incentives are to increase usership, which is both accounts and a lot of uh, usership is really driven by emotion in time spent on social media. And so it really incentivizes them to allow polarizing and anti-democratic content on social media. So um, increasingly, I, I see the viewpoint that there's a strong role for some kind of regulation um, in that space from the government to protect democratic um, institutions around information and media. Okay, any other responses from the panel? Um, okay, uh, a question just came in in terms of the level of trust, as you point out, in your findings that trust has declined. And that's also in other studies as uh, Abby pointed out. Uh, how do we go about promoting and rebuilding trust in democratic institutions uh, after this election, either in the case of a, a new presidency or if Trump wins a second term, 
what can we be doing concretely to try to rebuild trust in our democratic institutions and electoral process? I can take this one. Yeah, so um, the, to rebuild trust is a long-term process. And then I think partly why, I mean, before we kind of think about building trust, let's think about why at one point our trust sort of diminished, right? So I think partly it's this, uh, the, the trend of polarization. And in a way that we see people that we disagree with, not as rivalry, but like as enemies that we, we are scared of them. We disagree with them and we're scared with them. We had like really negative emotion against them. We see it in our, in our political elite. And we also see it in, in, in the mass as well. So as you demonize the, 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 op the opposition, so in a way it's very hard for them to like for, for everyone to oh, let's kind of come together, right? So I think partly is that we need to, we need to stop seeing the opposition as, as enemy and to you know, start dialogue, right? And second, so think about starting dialogue. It's, I mean, we all have experience of like, oh, it's hard to talk to, you know, your family or your friends that disagree with you. So the idea is like, if we can think about a culture or a structure that promote more civil, uh, more civil exchange, or that in, or in terms of a political structure, I think uh, in, again, I'm gonna to refer to uh, Steve uh, Levitsky and then uh, Sibla spoke in terms of talking about the, the idea of tolerance and forbearance, right? Those are the soft uh, guardrail for our democracy that we are not going to just you know, smash our enemies, smash our opponents when given a chance. It's, in, it's just a, it's a political game, but it's not the whole thing. So if we can, you know, um, in terms of our institutions, as well in terms of our you know, social and culture, to leave the little room that instead of just nailing your opponents because you're afraid that if they come back, they are gonna nail you the same way. We need to kind of have that little gap to, to, to start rebuilding our trust, to start rebuilding a more healthy relationship instead of seeing this as a zero sum game in our, in our political exchange and also in our daily life. Yes, um, so I think that it's important to also identify what institution uh, we are referring to. And, and if we think in particular, for example, uh, about the police, certainly in that case, I think that public policy is important and that reform uh, of the police is important, particularly to increase trust in the police among African-Americans um, in the case of the US. But I will say that uh, a similar situation applies to you know, many other countries and me being from El Salvador and knowing about Latin America is a similar situation to really restore um, trust in certain institutions such as the police. Um, a comprehensive police reform will have to take place. Very interesting. Good. Well, we have uh, about 10 more minutes uh, before the, the webinar window closes. So uh, uh, there's a couple of other questions that have come in. Um, uh, one asks about the, a couple of questions came in about the uh, electoral college in the United States uh, and questions about uh, why we have a situation where uh, a candidate can win the popular vote, but not be elected because of the electoral college? Is it time to get rid of that institution? What can be done to make our elections more genuinely reflective of the vote? So maybe uh, Paul or Maggie can start. Paul. Yeah, I, guess, I guess I was um, talking about this. Um, yeah, I think it's, and I want to move over to the Kenny example in just a second, but I mean, number one, so the whole point of the reason why people want to keep the electoral college was to keep the, you know, basically block populist leaders from becoming president or anti-democratic leaders from becoming president. Um, and we now have a, such a strong norm. And in some cases, in a lot of cases, um, states have requirements that the electors vote for 
um, the candidate that won the state. So in some way, the, the electors are really not playing that protective institutional role anymore. And if there's one, you know, a president that they would have blocked, it seems like it would have been Donald Trump, you know, given the, the founder's vision of this. Secondly, this is a, a policy and electoral system that the United States State Department, um, USAID, would never recommend another country institute. And this is why I want to bring it over to Kenya. A lot of those recommendations are from uh, international Western uh, government officials, elec election experts. Um, and right now, you know, so if, if Kenya can have a better electoral system, I'm wondering why the United States can't have a better electoral system that can um, keep us from having this situation where um, regularly we have very close elections and it seems very commonly the winner of the, uh, the most votes is not become the president of the United States. And very quickly, the two round system is that anybody from any party can run in the first round. And so you usually get lots of parties. Um, so we might have like the Libertarians and the Green Party. And that gives a, um, more diversity for, um, for people's opinions, like a parliamentary system. And then you just take, if no one gets over 50%, you take the top two candidates and have them go in a runoff. And in that case, one of the candidates has to win 50% of the vote. And it gives all the people that voted for a smaller party um, the option to vote for one of these larger two parties. And so it seems on, on so many measures, it's um, normatively and uh, it, you know, superior than the Electoral College. And so I'm a big advocate for moving towards something like that two round system. Bashir, did you want to say anything about the uh, Kenyan uh, reforms in that regard? I believe we're making progress, but it's it's not um, what we really what we, what we were really hoping for because, um, as as I said, in the 2017 election, we had we really I think it's the first African Supreme Court that that really um, cancelled the election results. So it was a fast in that we 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 were happy that. Our Supreme Court was was independent and transparent in that sense that it didn't um, bow down to the to the powers of the elite. So, but then again, the judgment that he made was um, going back to the ballot in two months, which was not enough time to make sure that the irregularities are fixed. So, we're making progress, but it's not the progress that we 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 hope for. So, I think in the, in 2022 we hope to make um, better. But I think we hope to do better and get election results that the people are happy with. Great. Thank you. And speaking of uh, Supreme Court, uh, uh, one question that came in and asked about the role of the US Supreme Court, uh, which uh, will have an incoming justice and has had its own uh, trust factors uh, somewhat diminished recently. What role uh, will the Supreme Court be called upon to play. We don't know, but uh, what what could be the potential impacts of this on on our democracy going forward? You mentioned in your study that uh, even if the court does make a decision, it uh, would may not may not uh, settle matters. So, if you could say a bit more about that in terms of the role of the court. So let me start and then uh, if anybody else, Maggie, if you want to jump on as well. The thing that we see in the comparative perspective is that Supreme Courts, the power of them is really de derived from their legitimacy and their ability to be viewed as independent and make uh, decisions that are, are viewed as independent. So in that case, it's worrying because we have a clear now ideological tilt towards the incumbent president. And we see in many other countries, um, incumbents uh, tinker with the Supreme Court to make sure they have friendly uh, justices or judges on. So in the case of a disputed election, they can get a favorable ruling. And I'm not, 
it's hard to tell whether that will or will not happen, whether there is bias towards a conservative or Republican candidate, um, or whether the justices will be independent. We're not, that's something that I don't think we can necessarily say. But especially among uh, Democrats, there's a increased concern that there is bias there. And that will, um, because of that bias, reduce the overall legitimacy of any decisions taken by the Supreme Court. So that's very worrying in this post-election phase. Um, and we already see indications that Trump is preparing some kind of legal challenge um, from things he said and in in other how he's organizing and kind of building a case. Um, and especially, of course, with this recent vacancy of uh, from Justice Ginsburg and the appointments of another justice, which is also seen as somewhat illegitimate given the timing of the election. So all these things are perhaps impacting um, the ability of the Supreme Court to be viewed as an independent institution. And that's very worrying if they have to make a very important decision, um, whether the decision will be respected and viewed as legitimate. Yeah, just a quick note on that, um, because Supreme Court, really, the, the, the Supreme Court, one of the function is to handle conflict, right, how to dis handle the dispute. And as Paul mentioned, like, if without the legitimacy, like, whatever ruling that comes out, people uh, will not be ready to abide by the ruling, people may just see it, well, you know, you are already tainted uh, with uh, partisanship. And so, and it's in long term, it's a very big problem because not only besides this election, there are a lot of cases that, uh, depending on a Supreme Court ruling, it will change the American, you know, society and, and the culture as well. So definitely, this is um, again, of course, we don't know to what extent um, whether how how the justice will rule and whether it's really that's uh, tilted um, on a certain uh, partisanship, but. This 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 phenomenon, this circumstances, is very worrying for the long term uh, of the American democracy. Okay, well, thank you uh, to our panelists again. I think we're out of time. A few more questions, but don't have time. So let me, uh, let me thank everyone again for participating, especially to our panelists Maggie and Paul and Abby and Bishara. Uh, thanks again to the Keo School for sponsoring this program. And uh, we will send to everyone here um, the uh, sites that Maggie mentioned about electoral support work and also maybe a copy of that a link to the blog that I mentioned. Uh, and we encourage everyone to work for democratic rights and human rights for all. So thank you very much. Have a, a pleasant rest of the afternoon.